Ladies and gentlemen, uh, today's speaker, Jimmy Bryson, some of you may know, um, quite high profile sometimes. Um, he's going to talk, uh, give us a 45 minute hour talk, and then after that, the other day, half hour for yes. any questions. <coughs> Look, thank you very much for the invitation to come and speak to your group. Um, del delighted to be here. Um, what I propose to do is I'm going to provide a lecture, as was set out by the chairman, allowing 45 minutes, but 45 minutes is a long time for somebody to, somebody to talk um, and people fall asleep um, uh, at, at, at regular intervals whenever you're talking for 45 minutes. So uh, what I'm going to do is I have a proposition, which I'm going to set out at the start, and I have an argument, which I'm going to convince, try and convince you on the marriage of, but as we go at various junctures, um, along the way, I'm going to pause and say, here's an opportunity to challenge me on what I've put forward uh, so that we can have some interaction uh, from the group. And hopefully at the end of it, I will have discharged the burden of convincing you uh, that my argument is right on this, or maybe I won't have, but at the very least, I hope we'll have a, a good discussion and will encourage you to think uh, of this issue. <coughs> So in this lecture, I'm going to argue one core proposition, which when you first hear it will sound controversial, but I hope to convince you of its merits. And it's this, that you cannot be pro-Belfast Agreement and the Unionist, because the Belfast Agreement is designed to end the Union. And I'll say that again, because that's what I want to keep you in your mind, because that's what I'm going to try and convince you of in today's lecture. And that is, you cannot be pro-Belfast Agreement and the Unionist, because the agreement is designed to end the Union. Uh, and in seeking to persuade you um, of the correctness of this proposition, I'm going to look at what is known a, a, as the peace process in its various component parts. Firstly, uh, I'm going to challenge the very notion of the peace process, peace process itself, um, and I'm asking you to consider why peace is entwined uh, with the process, which, and when I say process, it's the overarching phrase, for the Belfast Agreement. Secondly, uh, I'm going to invite you to agree with me as to what the meaning of a process is and its characteristics. And thirdly, I will then seek to persuade you, uh, assessing it in two parts, the practical outworkings of the, the process and the legal outworkings of the process, as to what I say the ultimate end process, or sorry, the ultimate end po point of the process is, which I say, is uh, a united Ireland. And as I've said, at each, at each juncture between those three parts, uh, I'm going to offer you an opportunity to challenge the arguments that I've put forward and thus defeat uh, my proposition. Uh, because if I fall on any of the one of the, the three sections, then my argument falls. Uh, so I hope we'll have plenty of interaction as we go. So if we start first on the, 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 the notion of a peace process, um, this is peace process has been part of the, the language of the uh, post-Northern Ireland 1998. It's developed almost the status of some holy lip, you know, a sacred term, uh, the peace process. The Belfast Agreement was a fallible political agreement between human beings. Uh, the Lord didn't come back to design it himself. We're all humans, we're all fallible, we can all make, we can all make mistakes. But it has, it has been given the status of infallibility, that it is beyond uh, challenge, that it is beyond uh, criticism. It's almost a hanging offence, actually, if you criticise it. And, uh, and I was at the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee three, four years ago making this argument, and, and Baroness Kate Hoey said, I mean, it's almost akin to want, saying you want to kill babies if you want to criticise the Belfast Agreement. And you see, I say there's a moral blackmail at the heart of all of this when you entwine peace with the process. And that is to say that if you want peace, if you want an absence of violence, then you must support a political agreement. And I say that cannot be right. Because if a political agreement is subject to peace, and the two, you can't have one without the other, then that gives a veto to those who would otherwise threaten violence. And that is at the core of the blackmail, which I say has been forced on the unionist community over the last 23 years to say, if you want A, you must support B. And that is how you're morally blackmailed into supporting a, an agreement, which you may dislike on its merge, but you're told if you don't support this, then that means you oppose peace. Uh, and as a result, it follows uh, that you must be a bad person. 
So I really want you to think on that for a moment. Uh, here's a political agreement drawn up by fallible human beings, and you're told, all of you are told, I'm told, society is told, that you must support that agreement, you must support the outworking of that agreement, because if you don't, then you endanger peace by refusing to support uh, a political agreement. And I would ask you to consider, how, how does that make you feel uh, as, as a person? Do you feel a sense of being blackmailed, of being held at the point of a, a metaphorical gun? And add into the mix then when you're considering this, imagine the media, academia, academia sorry, uh, the self-appointed elite of society, poking you in the chest and screaming in your face, uh, you will support this agreement because if you don't, you're an awful person. And if you don't support it, then people might die. And that is the circumstances of the last 23 years by the proponents of the agreement. And I say it's a form of moral blackmail. I say it's a form of bullying. And I say it's a form of coercion which seeks to shut down your own consideration of what is a political text and instead blackmail you into having uh, to support it. So the democratic majority of society and the circumstance which I have just set out and I have articulated, <coughs> de democracy does not rule by the exchange of ideas or a robust debate. Uh, instead, society is held uh, to the whims of those who have the most guns and the most bombs at, at the metaphorical sense that nationalism and the IRA, uh, who otherwise would threaten violence, say that you must support this agreement because we're the people with the guns and bombs and if you don't support our political objectives, then as a result of that, uh, you will pay a heavy price, and therefore that creates a situation when you do consider, is, is opposition to a political agreement worth it if it's going to lead to violence? But the difficulty with that is that you then give a veto to those uh, who, who uh, would threaten violence. So I say that peace should not be dependent upon a, uh, a, a, a political um, agreement being implemented. And at this juncture, I think we can all, and I hope you'll all agree with me, will accept one unimpeachable fact. Nationalism and republicanism did not wake up one day and say, I mean, everything we've, do, we've been doing over the last three decades has been wrong, and, and we apologise, and we're sorry for the hurt and the harm we inflicted upon you. They woke up one day and, and thought, we need to move our struggle to a new phase, uh, as they would term it. So they've only set aside violence because it's tactically suitable to them at this time, not because they've repudiated violence. And to this very day, they still would say that what they did uh, was, was, was correct. So, first stage of the journey I'm trying to take you on with me today, uh, I'm trying to con convince you that when you consider the peace process, we can consider it in distinct parts, that we can set peace aside, <coughs> because peace is the absence of violence. So if you are committed to peace, then you're committed to an absence of violence. You shouldn't be committed to peace on the basis, well, I'm committed to peace so as long as democracy is shaped to suit me, uh, otherwise, oh, I'm not too sure about that commitment to peace. So you can't have it both ways. Uh, so what I want to say to you at the start, and what I want to persuade you to do now at the first step, is to separate peace from the process. So we can treat these as two distinct issues. So as we go today, and I try and persuade you of my argument, I don't try and persuade you of setting aside the peace process. I try to persuade you of setting aside the process, because everybody in the right mind wants there to be peace. And the fundamental premise of that, and I say to you, and what I want to convince you is, that you can be fundamentally committed to peace, but absolutely opposed to the process. And you can set those two uh, things apart. On the initial point in terms of, have I succeeded in convincing you that peace and the process should be treated as two different things? Or do you think that, that the political agreement and peace should be linked together? No, they should be separate. No. They should be separate. Yeah. yeah. You, sorry, yes, please. You're saying there, <coughs> peace is the absence of violence. Yes. But not necessarily. If you even have no violence, you may not have peace. I think we don't have peace at the moment. We may be not have no violence, but we don't have peace. Well, in a general sense, I, I, I think you're right in terms of if you say that we can take peace in two parts. Peace in terms of there is still violence, violent dissidents, or <coughs> that's what you're referring to, yes. Peace then can also be, if we view it in the, in, 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 and I, I would put this more in the sphere of political conflict, in that whilst we have an absence of large scale conflict, 
we don't have an absence of conflict because there's still a political conflict. But I would I would put the political conflict, if that's what you're referring to, in terms of dispute between the two communities in the realm of the process because that's political. Uh, when I refer to peace, I refer to the as we would call it. Will they understand that the the IRA's terrorism campaign uh, and, and the conflict? But you're absolutely right. There's still violent dissidents uh, who are engaged. Yeah, uh, I mean, you, you did say there to stop the violence, but and then it went on to the political part. Mm -hmm. So that it's still part of their agenda. Uh, th this piece is only a. Is it sham over it all? Really? Stop that. Oh, uh, absolutely, and and that and that yeah. and that is the, that is the point that I try and convince yeah. you of that yeah. the peace is being used as a metaphorical gun to say that well, I mean, if you want to have peace, you have to go along with this this process. I mean, if I come up to you now and put a gun to your head and say, I mean, I want you to walk through that door. Um, doesn't matter what's on the other side of that door, but if you don't walk through it, I'm going to shoot you in the head. I mean. That, <laughs> You don't have a free choice as to whether to walk through the door. You're being taken through the door by coercion, uh, and that's why I say we should separate peace um, from the, the the process. So the second thing, which you helpfully uh, alluded to ahead of me, is then if we accept that we're going to deal now with the process, we're going to set the the peace process line needs to say, we're going to deal with uh, the process. We need to then consider well, what is a process? So when we talk about it, what is it? Um, and it's necessary for me to set that out in detail. If I, if I want to convince you of my argument, I have to tell you what my argument is in terms of process and to break that down. So I say, and I put it to you this, a process by its very dictionary definition has a beginning and an end, uh, that it constantly moves towards a predetermined end point. Now this is the Oxford Dictionary definition of a process. I think you actually probably put it a little better, but uh, it is firstly a series of actions or steps in order to achieve a political end, or secondly, a natural series of changes. Therefore, I simply ask you to accept the process is what it says that it is. Uh, it's not walking about aimlessly. Uh, it's not direction without direction. Sorry, uh, it is actually a stepping stone towards uh, a, 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 an end point. Um, and I say this is the most simple thing I ask you to accept today because it's it's quite clear in terms of my view what a process is in terms of its characteristics. It has a beginning and it has an end. It doesn't just float in the ether. So if you're part of a process, you're part of incrementally uh, working towards something. And again, I'm happy to be, I would say this will be the least contentious point of the day, but I'm happy to be challenged on to do we accept that if there is a process, that a process has to have a defined end point. Uh, do I, does that meet with acceptance from the, the group? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So I see from a unionist point of view, yes. for donkey's years when I'm doing the politician lots of state, yes. vote for unions. Up there present, I can't see anything at all that Sinn Féin has put down on the table to say, ah, oh, well, they're doing that, we'll have to go along now. We've got this bit, never, 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 no, 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 but it hasn't been. The cap no one and no one away and let's get on it. I'll sign him back. Well you, you you articulate my next point for oh, me right. in terms of the we could almost jump to the end here. Um smarter up the But but you have to You're absolutely right. So uh the next point we move on to there, so number one, I've convinced you I hope to separate peace in the process and deal with the process. Number two, we've accepted that a process has to have a defi defined end point. If you get in the car and you're going to a destination, you have a map, you might take detours along the way, but you know where you're going. And we all accept, I think, uh, that if there would be a process, the process has to have an end point. So the next phase we move on to then, and this is the most uh, <coughs> heavy part of the lecture in terms of detail, is that what is the process then? What is the end point of the process? And I'm going to deal with this in two parts. So I'm going to deal with the, the practical outworkings of the process, how it has worked in the last 23 years to where we are now, and then very quickly I'm going to deal with the legal point. Uh, I think the legal point is, is, is obvious and patently obvious, so I don't need to spend much time on that. I'm going to spend a little more time on, on, on the, the process itself. Now when I refer to the process, I refer to the, the outworkings of the Belfast Agreement, uh, and this, in its most obvious sense, as we would understand it, uh, refers to the political institutions uh, and the storm of the Assembly. However, the, the process is much more than that, uh, 
because the Belfast Agreement also created an ethos, or as it's become fashionable to label it, and I'm sure you will have heard this in, in the media and on the news, the spurred uh, of the Belfast Agreement. Now, let me put my hand up from the outset. I have tried as I might, been unable to conjure up this mythical spirit of the Belfast Agreement to consult with it. I'm not sure whether you need tea leaves or what you do, but I, I, I have never managed as yet to, to, to bring it up and ask it what it thinks uh, about various things. But nevertheless, I'm pretty confident in saying that when people talk about the spirit of the Belfast Agreement, what that actually means is that every constructive ambiguity within the Belfast Agreement must be resolved in favour of nationalism. And I say that to you, if you look at the last 23 years, uh, and, and, and you look at what's happened, I say that's borne out, that every ambiguity in the agreement, everything that was sort of left hanging, you know, constructive ambiguity, two sides can look at it different ways, it's always constructed and resolved in favour of nationalism. That ambiguity is never resolved in favour uh, of unionism. So when I talk about the spirit of the Belfast Agreement, let me say it again, I talk about every ambiguity being resolved in favour of nationalism. And if you accept that, and you agree with me on that, then you must accept, as a logical outworking of that, that the spirit of the Belfast Agreement is a nationalist spirit, because it only suits nationalist objectives. That is the only logical outcome if you accept the proposition that it's resolved in favour uh, of nationalism. And I say that the, the, that spirit of the Belfast Agreement has infected much more than just the political institutions. It has spread to academia, media, uh, civic society, policing, culture and our justice system. And in all of these key components of society, because all of these things taken together makes up what we understand to be our society, nationalism dominates. Uh, and, 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 and this is all thanks to the infectious spirit uh, of the agreement. And, and I just want to distill that a little bit because We've agreed that the spirit of the Belfast Agreement resolves in favour of nationalism. So what is a nationalist spirit? I then say that that spirit has infected all of the key components of our society. And I listed them for you. Academia, media, civic society, policing, culture and uh, the justice system. And that is because at its core, the process uh, makes it necessary that nationalism must be legitimised and amplified while this unionism must be delegitimized and dehumanized. And this is because to keep the process advancing towards its predetermined endpoint, it's necessary to remove any obstacles which stand uh, in the way of it. So those us unionists who are diametrically opposed to the end point of the process, to not to the spirit in nationalism's favour, are an obstacle. So in order to deal uh, with the obstacle, we must be removed. They can't put us on a boat and ship us away. So how they deal with this is they incrementally weaken your community and your political resistance step by step or piece by piece, uh, as I would term it, as, uh, as we go. Um, and that's because the side which is predetermined must be victorious in the process nationalism must be strengthened and unionism must be weakened. Because if you apply it a different way, if the, if the process had the capacity to strengthen unionism and advance our community, then the process would bang up against that because it couldn't advance towards its logical end point because there would be an obstacle in the way and that would be a growing unionism. So to keep the process moving forward, it's necessary to keep incrementally weakening unionism, which is diametrically opposed to nationalism, until you eventually reach at the end point. And all of this started in 1998, even by the way the agreement was sold, because to unionism, it was sold as a settlement, as this was it, the closing of the constitutional question dominating our politics, uh, and to nationalism, but it was sold as a process, as the start of a, a staging post which set forward the pathway to ultimately achieving a united Ireland. And the result of this is that a whole new generation of unionists were de demotivated, demotivated sorry, and depoliticised, uh, while simultaneously a whole new generation of nationalists were politicised uh, and, and, and were energised. And why that is, because when you say to a new generation of unionists that, that were young in 1998 or came post-1998, when it's sold to you as, this is, this is it, 
This is the settlement, the constitutional question, it's finished, it's all over, we're all going to live happily ever after. There's no real motivation to be politically active because the game's over. And that was the illusion created that the game's over in terms of constitutional question. Unionism can sit back and let's all work happily ever after in the new Northern Ireland. But for nationalism and young generation of <coughs> nationalists, uh, they were told, actually, here's the start of the path to a united Ireland. And the way to achieve that is you've got to get educated, you've got to get politicised, energised and motivated. And therefore you have a whole generation of nationalist activists who are pushing on towards that objective, while this union, a whole generation of union, unions has missed the generation, really, in terms of a, a mass movement uh, of uh, political activists. And as I touched on at the start, all this is evident in, in, in the key components of our society, uh, because it was never more evident, and I don't know if many of you have seen it or remembered it, but during the Brexit negotiations, Sinn Féin orchestrated letters being sent to the Irish Prime Minister. Uh, they were printed in the Irish News and other newspapers, and what it was was hundreds of persons labelled by their profession uh, signed on to this nationalist objective and self-identified uh, with the political cause of nationalism. And that was an extraordinary event for me because that was a very deliberate statement of supremacy uh, in the professional class. Unsurprisingly, this went largely unchallenged by the media, but you had hundreds of people identifying as nationalist journalists nationalist solicitors. I mean, let's take the Pat Finucane case. The whole basis of that is that lawyers shouldn't be identified by their private political views or by their clients. However, when it came now, nationalism are very happy to self-identify as nationalist lawyers, nationalist solicitors, nationalist journalists. And I can tell you, if I went to the Bar Library in the courts or I went to the, the media, the, the National Union of Journalists, and tried to get 10 people to self-identify as unionists and loyalists, I couldn't get you 10 people within the media or within the judiciary or within the, the legal profession uh, that would do it. And the media, I actually say, is inherently imbalanced in favour of nationalism, and that's unsurprising because the majority of media is dominated by nationalists. And the dominance is not even subtle or covert. Most nationalists in the media will quite happily, will quite openly uh, declare their allegiance uh, with men, many journalists actually quite openly doubling up as journalists and commentators. I mean, by day you're an independent journalist, by night you're appearing on TV as a commentator, putting forward uh, the nationalist cause. I'm not sure how those two things can coexist, but coexist uh, they, 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 they appear to do. Um, and as I pointed out, by comparison, there's shockingly few, few open and overt unionists uh, within the media. And it's obvious to point out as well in regards to new journalists, you know, those who've come into the profession in the last decade, that new generation uh, that I was talking about, they will mostly come from a generation which, two things, they've been infected with the coercive chorus of the peace process and the language of the peace process, so that the, the, they almost suffer from a form of Stockholm Syndrome, that because 23 years it's been drilled into a new generation, this process, this process, you must support it, all that's good and righteous about society requires you to support this process, so that's ingrained within their minds from a young age. And secondly, the world of social media is dominated by nationalism and that goes back to the fact that there's a new generation of nationalist activists which dwarf the amount of unionist activists because unionism has been depoliticised. So in the world of social media, if you want to get likes and retweets, and I don't know if some of you are on social media, but if you want to gain, be amplified on social media, all you need to do is criticise unionism and play as nationalism and all of a sudden that's you off to a good start in your career. I mean, Stacey will tell you, she's experienced this herself, I mean all day long I get perpetual constant abuse morning to night. If I woke up today and said, oh you know, I think I've been considered union, you know, I went to the Shankill today and I spoke to the group and you know what, I think they're awful people and what do these unionists know about anything and really they should all be considered uh, and, and, and they're awful people. All of a sudden, I would be the best guy in the world. They would have me on talk back on everywhere else because you've criticised unionism, and all of a sudden, that, that's good. And all of that then sits alongside those at the lower end of the media chain. Uh, and I should say, there's a clear distinction between these persons, the Sunday worlds of this world, um, uh, who belong actually more in the, the orbit of social media troll, uh, and credible journalists who actually work diligently and professionally. And there's many within Northern Ireland even who do self-identify as nationalists who are credible um, and professional journalists. 
However, the focus of my commentary in this instance is those who, in the media, in this lower chain of the media, seek to make a clear out of dehumanising our communities, incessantly trying to stoke up intra-community tension with hoax and false and malicious claims on a weekly basis and on site, alongside the dissemination of wholly false material uh, almost every week. Uh, and this, these persons try and give us the, the air of credibility, um, albeit this usually ends up uh, unsuccessful because most people still have a nose for generated nonsense, uh, but not in the world of social media, because if you want to be popular in social media, as I say, you say something negative about unionism and loyalism, and you are the, the man of the moment. But actually, I don't blame the low, the low level social media journalists who are, you know, they swim in the sewer to seek to find anything they can polish up to enhance their own credibility. Uh, actually, blame sometimes those within our own community who actually take advantage of these validation seeking sewer swimmers uh, to try and advance their own agendas by using these people uh, to, to, to plant stories and, and to use their desire to dehumanise unionism. And, and, and it's a really shameful thing um, that many people within our community do that. More concerningly, because of its impact, the legal profession is heavily dominated by nationalist activists, some who are friends of mine and some who are extremely skilled, and they are very skilled uh, and they're very good, uh, but they have weaponized the law to advance uh, <coughs> political goals, uh, often cloaked in rights-based language. I don't uh, criticize them for that, they're entitled to do it. I mean, I do it on the opposite side. Um, I'm involved in the law. Uh, I use it to advance political goals as well, but in terms of numbers of people involved, very few people in unionism are involved in that profession, vis a vis nationalism, uh, which absolutely dominates the, the, the legal profession. And this all, in the national sense, sits alongside a well resourced, well funded, and very formidable nationalist uh, legacy movement. Uh, and what that is all about is it's about rewriting the past <coughs> by perpetually blaming the state on everything that happened. But there's, a, there's an agenda behind that. Because if you blame the state and the state, if you can show that the state were inherently bad and everything the state did was wrong, then everything that the IRA did is almost subtly justified and absolved. Because at the end of the day, if there's this awful state, all-powerful state, that it's oppressing your community and you're the most oppressed people ever, well then, you know, the IRA will only, will only fight back against this oppression. So the, the objective behind the whole legacy narrative is to turn it around and say nationalists were good, the state were bad, rather than, as we all know, nationalism were bad and the state were, for the most part, good. Um, and, and, and that is a battle which is raging, and it's a battle which unionism and loyalism and victims on the unionist and loyalist side have been let down uh, and, and, and are not deeply involved in that battle and are not succeeding in pushing back on that narrative. And that's because there's not a well-resourced heavily funded uh, legal profession which is fighting that cause for unionism and loyalism and that's uh, victims within the unionism and loyalism community uh, and that's something which I think should change. And the dominance of the legal profession goes to the very highest points of the judicial system in Northern Ireland. Now if we were to take, for the argument's sake, even take the Belfast Agreement at its height, the underpinning ethos is supposed to be an equilibrium between two communities that in all the key aspects of the state, all the key organs of the state, both communities are meant to be equally represented. There's meant to be fairness uh, and, 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 and balance. Indeed, the assembly itself is carefully constructed along the lines of two communities, equal representation, and there's, well, until it comes to the protocol, but in, in a general sense, there's meant to be cross-community protections to prevent one community uh, dominating uh, over another. However, when it comes to the judiciary, the highest level of judges in Northern Ireland um, and the judiciary was reformed flowing from the Belfast Agreement, the criminal justice <coughs> reforms. For example, senior counsel in Northern Ireland QCs no longer have to swear an oath to the Queen. Uh, and when you go in to, to, to many courthouses, the emblems of the Crown have been removed in Northern Ireland. So our Queen's Court sitting in Northern Ireland have removed the emblems uh, of the Crown. But there's not even an appearance of cross-community balance in the judiciary. Uh, I can't remember the exact figure. It was a couple of years ago I did it, and I looked at Lord Chief Justice, who didn't disagree with me. Uh, I think it's somewhere in 85% of the most senior judges. It's certainly 
uh, no lower than that, it may in fact be higher, but 85% of the most senior judges, I talk about high court judges in Northern Ireland, come from the Catholic or nationalist community. Many of them actually who come from political backgrounds uh, in advance to uh, going on to the judiciary. And I make that point, if, an, if it was the other way around and the judiciary was dominated 85% by Protestants and Unionists, there would be positive discrimination. Uh, and that's a bit of a false term, positive discrimination, because it's, it, it's only positive for those who benefit, it's negative for the people who lose out on the merits. And as a general point, I believe that everybody should be judged on their merits and the best person for the job uh, should get the job. But the difficulty uh, in Northern Ireland is we have a system where there's meant to be this balance between two communities. And in the judiciary, it is a fact that is not cross-community balance. The judiciary is imbalanced in favour of the Catholic and nationalist community, and that's a fact of life. And so, so, so it's going to come to a point where the majority rules on their side. Were they fit, fought against it for 20 years? Well, I'd actually put a note in this. For example, uh, cross-community protections in the Belfast Agreement, uh, you know, the sacred cow, uh, the, 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 this, uh, it's called Section 42 in the Northern Ireland Act, the sacred cow, cross-community consent. When it came to the protocol, when nationalism along with alliance had a majority to force that on the union's yeah. community, mm -hmm. the cross-community consent mechanism was simply put in the bin. It was okay, no? yeah. so, 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 so this sacred cross-community consent is only sacred so long as it prevents uh -huh. unionism okay, from advancing. Yeah. It's not sacred when nationalism wants to put the foot on the neck of our community, it can be easily cast aside. And that, in fact, in of itself, should say to you that this process, there's something very wrong about this and something very uh, imbalanced about all of this. And the same trajectory, I say, as I've said out previous, has infected policing since the moment the PSNI was conceived in the womb of political appeasement. Because by accepting that it was necessary to cast aside the RUC to placate nationalists, there was an implied acceptance that nationalism's criticisms of the RUC uh, were well-founded and deserved to prevail. And I say this was actually a real betrayal of those who served in the RUC and the security forces uh, uh, and who did so honourably uh, and, uh, and, and, and properly. Uh, and after 20 years of the PSNI, I doubt that there's uh, many in the Protestant Unionist or Loyalist community who would feel, and i term this the PUL community as we go on, uh, who would feel the organisation has been anything other than a two-tiered system which has clung diligently to its founding objective of winning nationalist support and everything it's done since it has uh, clung to that. So if you create an organisation and the founding, the, if, if you accept, and I think you would all have to accept, that the PSNI was created to placate nationalists and as a result the RUC has to go. So if you accept that the, the birth date of the PSNI was in order to placate nationalists, then it should be no surprise that the, the, the PSNI have clung to that ethos and it still pervades throughout the organisation because no matter who the chief constable is, no matter the makeup of the organisation, it always works from its fundamental, it always goes back to its mother and father, which is the point that nationalism must be appeased. Support for national support within nationalist communities for policing must be maintained. For example, policing incident on the Orma Road commemoration at the Burgies, conflict between police officers and a number of nationalists, Sinn Féin, outraged, furious, uh, within a day, Chief Constable throws his own officer under the bus because the primary objective was not even to maintain the morale of the officers of the PSNI, the primary objective was to ensure nationalists stayed on board and that should tell you everything you need to know about the police. And this is true not only in the ethos and policy direction of the PSNI, it's true too in its operational decisions. I'll take one example for you. There's a paramilitary crime task force, PCTF, uh, and it focuses almost exclusively on loyalists. And nobody disputes there's crime in loyalist communities. But nobody could seriously say to me that there's more crime in loyalist communities than there is in nationalist and republican communities. Crime is a societal problem. It's not a loyalist problem. It's not a republican problem. It's a problem for society. It's a problem in Manchester. It's a problem in Glasgow. It's a problem in Liverpool and, and, and everywhere else. So it's a fallacy to believe that it's justifiable to say there's more crime in loyalist communities vis-a-vis -vis nationalist communities, because that's simply not true. So I then ask, why is there a specific unit, unit in the police whose modus operandi uh, is to be presenting crime as a predominantly loyalist problem? 
And the answer to that is very, very clear, and it's multifaceted, but it's nevertheless uncomplicated. As I said out previously, the process requires legitimization of nationalism uh, and republicanism, and conversely, if, I, if you accept that the process requires nationalism to be amplified and legitimized, conversely, because it's on the opposite side, you have to accept that the process requires uh, that unionism and loyalism is delegitimized uh, and, and, and dehumanized. So P policing assists this, this process objective because it criminalizes and dehumanizes uh, loyalist communities, often with a, a broad blush. And the police in writing to me, and I can provide this to anybody, confirmed that the paramilitary crime task force do not investigate the provisional IRA. And they, they put that in a letter to me, and I, I've published it on social media. I'm happy to provide you with a copy. I'm going to get you a copy of this lecture after. They look to me in writing, the PCTF, the paramilitary crime task force in Northern Ireland, do not investigate the IRA. And they say, uh, that's because terrorism is a national security issue and doesn't fall under the PCTF and that to be frank is complete and utter nonsense. Uh, the Terrorism Act, and I'm going to diverge into a little bit of law here, uh, does not have a hierarchy of prescribed organisations uh, nor is there a special category which creates prescribed, prescribed organisations and paramilitary organisations. If you're prescribed under the Terrorism Act you're prescribed. So every organisation which is prescribed under the Terrorism Act will be the UVF, the UDA, the IRA, the INLA, they're all on the same, the same plane and therefore if you're going to have a paramilitary crime task force then the paramilitary crime task force should investigate every organisation which sits under that. But that of course is not the case because the IRA are again granted uh, uh, special dispensation with this artificial difference between loyalists and republicans because loyalists are bad and republicans are good but then again go back to the whole ethos of the peace process because that's the whole purpose mm. of it you shouldn't be surprised at that because that's what it was designed to do and you don't need to take my word for any of this uh, because I'll actually provide you here the words of the PSNI's former assistant chief constable Alan McQuillan who went on to become head of the asset recovery agency and this was reported in the Belfast newsletter and, uh, and I provided a a copy of the link if you want to look it up yourself, but I'll read uh, ACC McClellan's words to you. These are his words now, not mine. There was a great desire by the British government to play down the public in crime, to not admit that the IRA was still active in crime, or active at all. We could only take cases on referral from other law enforcement agencies, so they had to give us the cases. We got lots of cases of loyalist crime, and we were hugely successful against those, to the extent that unionists began to complain about bias. But what we would not be getting was a hardcore entry into the criminality of the public and nationalist paramilitaries. I think the decisions were political, not operational. The issue here was the management of the peace process and nothing must be done that would disturb the politics of the situation. And that is the words of a former assistant chief constable who is by no means a loyalist or a unionist. So if we take ACC McQuillan's point, he says we can't even investigate Republican crime because to do so would effectively uh, dehumanise that community, would be an obstacle to the peace process because the peace process, sorry, the process makes clear that that community has to continually advance and be strengthened. But there's no problem investigating loyalism because loyalism has to be constantly dehumanised and criminalised and run down. Because remember what I said, if you're an obstacle to the process, you've got to be weakened and you've got to be taken out of the, the process. So remember that and remember my earlier argument and put that into the zone of policing. To advance the process, it's necessary to remove obstacles. And how better to criminalise a community and dehumanise a community as nothing more than criminals to weaken it and to help advance the process. And the same themes I've developed in relation to the media, the legal profession, the justice system and policing can equally be applied to academia, to the civil service and almost every statutory body in Northern Ireland. The spirit of the agreement has infected them all. And it's done so, so successfully that actually it's almost <coughs> reduced elections to the point of being really uh, symbolic. Because if, if nationalism has <coughs> if you control all of the organs of the state, if you control the media, policing, the judiciary, the civil service, and all the statutory bodies, from the housing executive to the trades commission and everything else, it doesn't really matter who wins the election because political power 
only lasts yeah. for a period of five years and then there's another election. If you control the organs of the state, yeah. then you're the one that actually controls the state. So now, the importance of elections is actually secondary to the fact that nationalism has actually taken over all of society. It doesn't matter if unionism won 100 seats, because all of the organs of the state are controlled by nationalism who could frustrate whatever unionism wanted to do, and that's a legacy of the last 23 years. And I say again, that's exactly what it was designed to do. And there's further, predictably, uh, a strong assault on the cultural traditions and the institutions of the PL community. Take one example, the, the Plades Commission. Consider the years since the Plades Commission came into force and ask yourself one question. Has our community gained cultural rights or lost cultural rights? And the answer to that, I say, is clear. The agitation, in many instances, the acts of violence uh, by nationalists were rewarded by restrictions on unionist periods and expressions of unionist culture. And I don't need to dilate on this any further. I can simply remind you, Drum Cree is gone. The Crumlin Road is gone. The White Rock traditional route is gone. All gone to appease nationalist threats of violence. I'll take you back again, because that's what the process is designed to do. On a yearly basis, we now see heavily armed police units sent in at the behest of nationalist politicians to eradicate PUL cultural bonfire celebrations. And whatever about justifiable concerns around some bonfires, and there are justifiable concerns around some bonfires, is there anybody in our community that is actually content with three nationalist government ministers and the PSNI sitting around the table taking decisions as to what cultural celebrations uh, are allowed to take place within mm. our community. Uh, and I've put a wee note at the bottom, you can read this hopefully if you get a copy of the, the lecture. I was involved in a High Court case representing Bonfire Builders of Tigers Bay in the High Court and when we got disclosure in the High Court, um, and this is in the public domain, there is a working group set up to take decisions as to what bonfires should be targeted. It's Nicola Malm, SDLP Minister. Deirdre Hargy, Sinn Féin Minister, Naomi Long, Alliance Minister, and the PSNI. And those are the four groups who sit together and they decide what unionist bonfires should be targeted. All of this went on uh, behind our backs without our knowledge and only because we burst into the High Court case that we managed to get uh, disclosure of all of this. So the culture war is raging, continues to rage, and it's patently obvious that all of the organs of society both political and, and civic in Northern <coughs> Ireland have trained their weapons on assisting the eradication of PUL culture and tradition. And why is this? This is not just something that happens. Because if you demolish a community's culture and you demolish a community's identity, then you significantly weaken that community. And I'll, I'll give you an example which you all understand. Your group comes together here. This is a shared purpose which you have. You are strong together as a group. This is your, your shared community purpose coming together in your, in your SASH group. If your SASH group was restricted and demolished, essentially, you as a group would be significantly weaker, not only as individuals, because I would say people who come collectively to this group and engage in discussions and make friends improve as people because you, you grow in your own confidence and grow in your own skills. If this group was taken away from you, if this shared culture was removed from you, you would be weaker as people and your community from which you've come would also be weaker. And that is the overriding ethos between targeting unionist and loyalist culture. Because if you break all that down and you've no shared purpose and you've no shared community, you've weaker people within the communities and you've a weaker community. And remember what I said, the process requires the removal of obstacles which stand in the way of it reaching its end point. And that's why they want to break all of that down. So in light of all of that, um, and I should say, I've only scratched the surface. All of these issues I'm covering could be a, a three-hour lecture then off themselves. Don't worry, I'm not going to go on for three hours. Um, but, but I say to you, and I, I want to persuade you, I, I put the argument to you, is that, that the logic of what I've said I must compel you to accept that the practical outworking of the process is purely and exclusively in favour of nationalism. In short, if I was to... And, and I have to I have to give credit to this. I'm working at the moment with uh, did some work with John Largan, QC, the former Attorney General, who's probably the finest constitutional lawyer anywhere in the United Kingdom. He's probably the finest lawyer of his generation. And I, I was uh, having lunch with, with with Mr. Largan, and we were discussing this issue about about the process. 
uh, and 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 I said, how would how would you sum it up in terms of the section one of the Northern Ireland Act, the plo the process substance be symbol sim symbolism? And he says to me, you can change everything, but the last thing, and we're going to come on that. I want you to keep that in your head. But the process is all about change everything, but the last thing. So when it comes to change the last thing, it doesn't really matter because everything else has changed anyway. And if I am going to sum up the process in a sentence, and these are my words, I take credit for this, this is not <laughs> Mr. Larkin's words, but it is really simple. The process is this, unionism must give and nationalism must get. And that is what the last 23 years has been all about. So if you accept that analysis, and you accept that I'm right on that, then you accept that the practical end point of the process has an outcome favourable to nationalism. And it's a fact of life, if the outcome is favourable to nationalism's constitutional objective, it's detrimental to unionism's constitutional objective, because the two objectives uh, oppose each other. So if the nationalism constitutional objective wins, the unionism constitutional objective loses. Those two can't uh, coexist. However, um, as ever throughout this journey, I'm asking to come, <coughs> come on with me this morning through the, the lecture. And, and remember now, we're dealing with the, the practical outworkings of the process. Uh, I'm happy to any challenges or counter arguments to the points uh, that have made. And if there's any general questions, by the way, happy to take them at, at the end. But if there's any questions as to what I've said uh, and you want to challenge my arguments on this or disagree with me, then, then, then please. Like, what what Tony Blair did was yeah. this 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 agreement, the Belfast Agreement it was called, and that's the name of it's a Belfast Agreement. Yeah. Tony Blair then came out and started talking the hand of history on his shoulder. I mean the Lord came down and touched him. Um and, and then the Belfast Agreement came, the Good Friday Agreement. Yeah. Again there was a purpose in that because it was to give it the status of some kind of oh good Friday, this yeah, this true. holy agreement, you know, it's yeah. almost it's almost biblical. I mean it was a political agreement between t Tony Blair, who's one of the biggest chancellors going. <laughs> See the protocol and, and what you what you explain. The protocol is only a logical outworking of the Belfast Agreement. Because yeah. what is the Belfast Agreement? The Belfast Agreement is that nationalism's political objectives must be advanced. Or if there's not, there must be a threat to peace. And that's the first issue we 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 we, we dealt with. And that's why we have this term, the peace process. All all the protocol and Brexit did was they just took the model of the peace process and applied it to the protocol and said that well, nationalism's objective is an all Ireland economy, economic union, because from economic union yeah. comes political union. So, uh, in order to advance that objective, we must have our way on Brexit because if we don't, well, there might be a risk to peace. And it just, it just applied the model that we spoke about at the start. You know, that if you want the process, you have to have peace and uh, and vice versa. So that's where it all came from. So the protocol actually stems from the Belfast Agreement. It only it only adopted the new model. So nobody should be surprised at how the protocol worked out because it's only another stage in post um, from the, the the process the Belfast Agreement set in. I hope and think I've convinced you that the process in, um, in, in practical terms is a process which has only a nationalist end point uh, and the end point of United Ireland. Have I, are you with me on that? Or yeah. 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 Very quickly on this point, then I'll just deal, even though I think we're over the, over the hurdle of, of, of that point in terms of convincing you, but nevertheless it's about the basis exercise. Uh, the process in law. Um, uh, the Northern Ireland Act 1998, which is domestic law, um, and that transported the multi-party uh, political agreement known as the Belfast Agreement, its annex to the British Irish Treaty, uh, into domestic law. So wow. the Belfast Agreement itself is actually not part of domestic law. It, it finds its translation in what's called the Northern Ireland Act 1998. The Northern Ireland Act 1998 envisages only one end, and that's the referendum on the United Ireland. And the question being put persistently thereafter until the answer is yes. <coughs> Once the answer is yes and the United Ireland is achieved, uh, then the process provides for nothing else. Uh, so that's that's the end point. There's no provisions within the Belfast Agreement or the Northern Ireland Act to say that well, if there's a vote for United Ireland, here's the process for getting back into the United Kingdom, because the process ends when the vote is yes for United Ireland, because the process is designed to ultimately deliver. A united Ireland. Therefore, as a pure matter of law, the end point set out in the Belfast Agreement and translated into the 1998 Act is strikingly clear, and it would require intellectual self-deceit on an industrial scale uh, to close your eyes to that which is plainly obvious. And the end point, the place where the process is going, 
is a united Ireland, and that is the only end envisaged in the Northern Ireland Act. Now, I should preemptively deal with one of the core contentions put forward by pro-agreement unionists, um, and it's this, uh, and they say that um, the principle of consent is enshrined within the Belfast Agreement and the Northern Ireland Act, and that protects uh, the substance of the union. Uh, now, I've developed this recently in, in a number of different lectures, <coughs> and I say actually the principle of consent doesn't protect the substance of the union, it only protects a symbolism. You can change everything but the last thing. I'm going to develop that point a little bit. But in the, in the substance theory, which is, if you take pro-agreement unionism's point at its height, uh, they say the union is protected in all its parts. The union uh, prevails within the ambit set, set out in what's called the constitutional protections in section 1, subsection 1 of the 1998 Act. In short, you can't change anything that would alter the substance of the union until the majority vote for United Ireland. That's a case made by pro-agreement unionists who say, oh, well, we've got the principle of consent. In the symbolism theory, which I say has uh, prevailed practically over the past 23 years, and actually recently prevailed in the High Court in the first instance decision, and I should say I think Mr Justice Colton was wrong on this, uh, we'll see if the Supreme Court is late or not, but that's where we stand at the minute. But, but the symbolism theory is that you can incrementally dismantle the union piece by piece, and it's only the severing of the last tie which attracts the constitutional protections. So I say it again, you can change absolutely everything about the union except the last thing, except the last line of the union flag at Hillsborough Castle. And if that's right, then the protections are only a fig leaf, because by the time we get to changing the last thing, everything else about the union will have been changed uh, in, 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 in any event. <laughs> so at, at, at its simplest form, as I say, you can change everything but the last thing. So if you want to, if you want to, if you're talking to anybody, and um, what is the the principle of consent, the symbolism of it, change everything but the last thing. No. Um, but but in the in, in the symbolism in the symbolism theory, um, and we've seen this through a protocol. You can change the very foundational constitutional stone of the union. So, what is the union? The union is the act of union in law. So, if you can change the act of union, which has happened by the protocol, you can hand law-making powers for Northern Ireland over to the European Union, a foreign power, and you can leave Northern Ireland subjugated in the economic United Ireland, and you can do all of this without offending the principle of consent then you're just changing everything but the last thing. And I make this point. If, for, if powers over laws in Northern Ireland can be handed over to a foreign power, if the economic integrity of the United Kingdom can be shredded, and you can do all this without offending the principle of consent, there's nothing to prevent joint authority. Because equally as laws are handed over to the European Union to make laws for our country, without any democratic say of the people of Northern Ireland, Equally, the power to make laws could be handed to Dublin to make laws for Northern Ireland. And in fact, given Dublin's representation in the European Union, the Dublin government actually have more say over some laws which now affect Northern Ireland than the, 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 the sovereign parliament. And the protocol, as I've said, is not the subject of this lecture, plainly because that subject needs a lecture all of its own, uh, welds Northern Ireland to the Irish Republic in an economic union. And as clear from the European Union's own model, and indeed the model of the United Kingdom itself, economic union and political union go hand in hand. So that's why it's been necessary to demolish the economic union of the United Kingdom by removing the fundamental provision in the Act of Union which provides uh, for the United Kingdom's internal market in order to facilitate Northern Ireland going into an all-Ireland economic union. And if you take the time to read the European Union's own recent communique as they like to title them on extending grace periods, the purpose they say very clearly is the reorientation of trade uh, in basic terms to move our trade away from GB and towards Dublin. And if I, if I distill that down, what that means is that our e economy, our economic trade should be on an all Ireland basis, not on an all United Kingdom basis. And if you take away the economic, because, because the union in terms of the United Kingdom. It's not just a political union, it's also an economic union. 
So if you take away the economic union and hand that over to an all Ireland, you're on the window ledge of the union. You have you have changed one of the big things, uh, except the last thing. And I would urge you, if you get the chance, the United Kingdom recently published a command paper, they called it, on, on the protocol. But go to paragraph 47, and it states, and this is our own government, that whilst the protocol makes clear Northern Ireland is part of the United Kingdom internal market, uh, this is not, in fact, the position and practice. And the government's own paper, this is the government's words, not mine, says this. The protocol is clear that Northern Ireland is fully part of the United Kingdom's customs territory. So far, so good in the symbolism. But this principle does not apply in practice. And that, folks, I say, perfectly sums up my substance or symbolism theory. Symbolically, the first part of that sentence, Northern Ireland is fully part of the Northern Ireland is fully part of the United Kingdom's customs territory. Symbolically, fabulous. But when it comes to actually the substance of it, no, that doesn't work in practice. So if I can conjure up this metaphorical example for you in your heads, because I really want everybody to get this and, and, under, and understand the importance of this. You can go into your house and you can knock the wall down between it and the neighbouring property. You can join both properties together internally. You can refurbish it entirely. You can remove the basic freedoms of the tenant to enjoy their cultural music within the confines of their own home. And you can paint the exterior of the you can paint the exterior of the house green, white, and gold. And you can even, as a belt of blazes exercise, knock down the fence in the garden between the two previous properties, which uh, mark the line between the previous boundaries. And you can even bring the gardener in to harmonise the lawns between the two properties into one big garden. However, so long as you don't formally sign over the deed to the property, then the tenants have no recourse. You can change everything. But the last thing, so long as you don't hand over the deeds of the house, plan it to an Northern Ireland sense, you can dismantle the union, you can change absolutely everything. But so long as you don't formally sign over the deeds of the house, all is good. So that's why I dismiss as absolute folly uh, the claim that the principle of consent is a gain for unionism, or in fact provides any protection for unionism. It's in my view an nonsensical proposition uh, that we should if we take this theory at its height, be thankful that our sovereign government apparently uh, won't arbitrarily hand us over to our covetous neighbours. This demonstrates the absurdity of this point. What we are meant to be thankful for in the Belfast Agreement is, firstly, terrorists won't murder and bomb us anymore, and secondly, as a gesture of goodwill, our own sovereign government, which many people fought and died in many world wars for, won't arbitrarily hand us over without us formally agreeing to sign over the deeds. But don't forget, you can still change everything but the last thing. And in equally derisory terms, I dismiss the argument that the agreement is the best way of maintaining the union. And I heard this actually a unionist politician said this to me not long ago and I nearly fell off my chair. Um, and it, that revolves, it resolves itself to a basic proposition, and it's this, that in order to save the union for the time being, we must participate uh, in a process which requires us to acquiesce in the incremental destruction of the union. Essentially, the argument is this. If you want to save the union, you must incrementally weaken the union. That's an absurdity. That doesn't logically follow. And the fact that unionism for 23 years has somehow found itself following that theory without any logical application, to me, strikes me as in incredible. So on uh, those points, uh, happy to take any questions of the floor before we very briefly move on to our last portion of this. So. Have I, what I've tried to convince you of is this, I've tried to convince you that the process has only one end point, and that's United Ireland. Yeah. I've tried to convince you that the process is entirely constructed in favour of nationalism, which in consequence is to the detriment uh, of unionism. And I'm happy to take any challenges or questions on that proposition uh, if anybody disagrees with me. We can, move on, we can move on to the last part then. So in conclusion, <coughs> this is what I say. The Belfast Agreement believed in the life a process, the fundamental guiding star of which was providing a mandatory pathway to incrementally weaken Northern Ireland's place within the United Kingdom. Essentially, when you distill it, you properly analyse it. Uh, the position underpinning the Belfast Agreement is this. 
in exchange for nationalism ceasing murdering our community and for Northern Ireland to be symbolically permitted to remain in the Union for the time being. Unionism must willingly and with good grace participate in a process which will incrementally dismantle the Union and eventually lead to a United Ireland. Firstly, I sought to persuade you that the phrase peace process was an act of moral blackmail and I asked you to agree with me that it should be disregarded with the implicit acceptance that the threat of violence as a tool of coercion uh, should not be permitted to prevail. Secondly, I asked you to agree with me that a process by its very definition has a predetermined end point. And then thirdly, in two component parts, I sought to persuade you that the process, both in its practical and its legal outworking, had only a pro-nationalist trajectory with the end and point being a United Ireland. And in this, I also presented an argument to you that the principle of consent in fact provides no protection at all for the substance of the Union and in fact it's actually a deceptive snare uh, insofar as it's actually a tool to change everything but the last thing. So finally we reach the end of our journey together uh, in this lecture and if I, have cons if I have succeeded in bringing you with me on those three hurdles which I have uh, set out and so far as I've persuaded you as to the merits of the arguments that I've presented, um, that you, applying your own independent thought process, think my arguments should prevail, then it follows that I've discharged the burden of proving the proposition which I undertook to prove at the beginning of this lecture. Because if you agree with me that the threat of nationalist violence shouldn't be permitted to hold democracy hostage, and you agree with me that a process must have a defined end point, and you agree with me that that end point, both practically and, a matter of, and as a matter of law as a United Ireland, then the conclusion is inevitable. It follows that if you are a unionist and you acquiesce in the process, then you participate in the destruction of the union. As such, the proposition I set out at the start of this talk, you cannot be pro-agreement and pro-union because the agreement is designed to end the union. And by way of a quote at the end, I'll just add this. The process has infected every aspect of society, and as we've set that out, all the aspects of society which has been infected, if you try and untangle that thread by thread, uh, think of it as a knot, it would, only, it would only tighten it if you tried to untangle it thread by thread. So the only way to resolve the issue is to cut the knot down the middle, at which point all the component parts will uh, unravel. So unionism as it stands now still has the power to cut the knot down the middle, uh, if unionism withdraws from the institutions of the agreement, the agreement falls uh, and uh, by virtue of its own fundamental requirements for the union to survive it requires cross community support. So no unionism, no agreement. Cut the knot. Uh, thank you very much for your time and I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you. Uh,